Hello? Hello, fool. This is the bank. We're calling to let you know you have an outstanding balance. Oh, thanks. I used to do gymnastics. The Fool's Journey. <laughs> Following his encounter with the Angel of Death, the Fool soon finds himself in the company of a different sort of angel, pouring liquid from one chalice to another with little regard for the laws of gravity. Welcome. You have come a long way, traveller. Why not rest a little while? Oh, thank you. I think I might do just that. What are you doing there? I'm combining two precious things to create something very special. Right. You know you've got one foot in the water. Your toes will go all wrinkly. Why, of course. My feet mirror my hands. Tell me what you've learnt along your path, traveller. Ooh, lots of things. Skill, inner wisdom, strength, resolve, you name it. Now it's time to apply those things to the real world. In my right hand, I hold the element of water. This represents your emotions, always flowing and changing. These manifest themselves in your mind. In my right hand, I carry the element of earth, the physical realm. Your actions manifest themselves here. Okay, so why would I need to combine them? So you can become the real you. The real me? But I'm pretty sure I'm already the real me. I'm not an imposter. So you have never regretted anything? You've never looked back and cringed with shame or regret at something you have said or done? Oh yeah, sometimes I've put my foot in it or done the wrong thing. And would you say that was the real you? Well, no actually. Sometimes our emotions can get the better of us, causing us to act in a way that isn't in accordance with our beliefs. But when your inner feelings and outer actions are balanced with each other, then, and only then, will your life become one of perfect harmony. Right. So how would I go about doing that then? It's incredibly difficult. Oh great, come on then, tell me what I've got to do. Nothing. Nothing? I thought you said it was difficult. Sometimes doing nothing can be the hardest thing in the world. Knee-jerk reactions are so easy, they're almost automatic. But to step back and look at a situation before you react takes temperance. Right, well I'd better get out there and do, uh, nothing. Excellent. Now go forth into the world and continue your journey with authenticity. A harmonious relationship between mind and body will take you a very long way, traveller. I see. Thank you very much. The fool makes his way from the wrinkly-toed angel to embark on the next step of his journey. To be continued. Welcome back to Keepy's Quest. This week we're looking at card number 14 in the Major Arcana, Temperance. This is the card all about finding balance and harmony within ourselves. If you've ever lost your cool in a situation, then I'm sure you'll appreciate what we're talking about here. Now there is some overlap with the strength card in terms of being able to restrain ourselves, but temperance is more about having our emotions and our actions in perfect harmony with each other. This allows us to deal with all situations effectively, regardless of how stressful or disastrous they may seem. We've all got times we can look back on and cringe because we handled them so badly that we can't even believe we were in charge of ourselves. These are the kind of thoughts that pop into our heads at three in the morning when we can't sleep. Temperance, on the other hand, is the perfect version of ourselves, who deals with everything that life throws at us with effortless grace. Now the dictionary definition of temperance is moderation or self-restraint. This conjures up images of teetotalers, or the temperance movement, which sprang up in the 19th century to promote abstinence from alcohol and demand that it be made illegal. This was a contributing factor in the prohibition laws of the US in the 1920s. Unfortunately, things didn't quite have the desired effect, and the laws were scrapped in 1933. Regardless, this particular definition leads people to see temperance as a form of depriving ourselves of something enjoyable, but that's not what this tarot card is about at all. Rachel Pollack says that the tarot temperance is not an artificial inhibition according to a moral code, but exactly the opposite, the true and proper response to all situations as they arise. Arthur Edward Waite's brief definition from the key to the tarot is economy, frugality, management and accommodation. Earlier cards all show a similar figure, pouring water from one jug to another. This is based on the virtue of temperance, from Greek and Christian philosophy. Temperance is the final reference to the tarot to the four cardinal virtues, the others being strength and justice. Prudence still doesn't have a tarot card, but the good news is that this is the last time I'm going to have to knock together an imaginary prudence card in order to make that point. Bye! The Wade Smith version shows the same figure, breaking the laws of physics to get fluid from one chalice to another. According to Waite, a winged angel, with the sign of the sun upon its forehead, and upon its breast, the square and triangle of the septenary. 
Waite is referring here to the most common solar symbol, that being a circle with a dot in the center. Aye. Also, I've decided to continue putting things onto that monk's forehead. Why? Why not? The septenary that he's talking about comes from the septenary principle. This refers to the idea that the number seven is sacred because it keeps popping up all over the place. In Christianity, we've got the seven sacraments, seven deadly sins, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the book of Revelations is littered with the number seven. In the Indian religions, we've got the seven sages, seven chakras, seven lokas, seven talas. Outside of religion, we've got seven seas, seven wonders of the world, seven notes in the major scale, seven continents, seven dwarfs, Anyway, this video is in danger of turning into a rather bland list of things that there are seven of. Suffice it to say that seven certainly seems to be an important number, hence the square and circle with its seven points. This is a very important symbol in theosophy. Theosa what? A brief history of theosophy. Theosophy is a philosophical system that was founded in the United States in the late 19th century by Russian mystic Helena Blavatsky and American writers Henry Olcott and William Kahn Judge. Considered a religious movement by some, this term was rejected by Blavatsky, who described it as a system that embraced the essential truth underlying all religion, philosophy and science. The movement took elements of Western and Eastern religions and combined them to form a system that is underpinned by one core tenet, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste or colour. Together with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Theosophy played a big part in the Western occult revival of the 19th century. Above the septenary symbol, we can see the Tetragrammaton, returning from the Wheel of Fortune card. These are the four Hebrew letters that make up the divine name of God. Yud, He, Vav, He. Behold, I've just figured out a way to rotate the Earth so it receives an equal distribution of sunlight and darkness. Wow, that's amazing! What are you going to do now? I think I'm going to call it a day. As we talked about in The Fool's Journey, the angel has one foot on land and the other on water. This is to demonstrate the combining of the inner and outer aspects of our character. Waite says it has one foot upon the earth and one upon the waters, thus illustrating the nature of the essences. A big part of the occult is the uniting of opposites, in particular the conscious with the unconscious. As above, so below. As within, so without. Right, so it's a bit like wanting a cheese sandwich and then making yourself a cheese sandwich. No, that would be combining the conscious with the conscious. You don't have to work very hard to achieve that. In fact, I think that's pretty much the default state. In the background, we can see a bright light, and if you look at it in the right way, you can just about make out a crown. Wade says above there is a great light through which a crown is seen vaguely. Here is some part of the secret of eternal life. He doesn't elaborate on this, but after careful consideration, I've decided that it's probably something good. Gosh, that's certainly some insight. But what does it all mean? When the temperance card shows up, it's often a sign that we're doing okay. We're in charge of our lives and not faced by anything, chiefly because our emotions and actions are in perfect harmony with each other. It can also be a warning that we may soon find ourselves in a position where we need to stay calm and exercise control over our instincts. Sometimes we can find ourselves reacting too quickly to a situation and doing something that we may regret later on. The Angel of Temperance tells us to slow down and think about what we're doing so we can give the best response. When temperance appears upside down, it can indicate a failure to stay in control of ourselves and a tendency to fly off the handle at every little obstruction that comes our way. If we ever find ourselves in a state of being overwhelmed by what's happening around us, it usually follows that we will make poor judgments. According to Rachel Pollock, on a simple level, the reverse temperance tells us to calm down and avoid extremes. Correspondence Corner! Temperance sits on the 25th path of the Tree of Life between Tiferet and Yesod. This is the path between beauty and foundation. The angel corresponds to the Hebrew letter Samek, which means prop or support. Their musical note is G-sharp. Yay! <coughs> their corresponding herb is Echinacea and their zodiac sign is Sagittarius. Echinacea also helps to prevent the common cold. And what exactly has that got to do with temperance? Well, you can't be temperate if you're sneezing all over the place, can you? Temperance brings us to the end of the second line of the Major Arcana, 
and what Rachel Pollock refers to as turning inward and the search for self-knowledge. By now, we've been through the formative process of learning about the world from our parents and teachers. We've looked inside ourselves to find out who we really are, and now we're ready to begin what Pollock refers to as the great journey and the goal of enlightenment. She goes on to say, finally, what of the last line? What can go beyond finding our true selves? To put it simply, these seven cards depict a confrontation and finally a unity with the great forces of life. We'll begin that journey next time with the devil. Oh yes we will. The big takeaway from the temperance card is the concepts of keeping our lives in balance and finding a harmony between our emotions and our actions. Once again, we'll leave you with Arthur Edward Waite's summary of the card. It is called temperance fantastically because when the rule of it obtains in our consciousness, it tempers, combines and harmonizes the psychic and material natures. Under that rule, we know in our rational part something of whence we came and whither we are going. Thank you for tuning in once again to Kippy's Quest. May the coming days bring you tranquility, focus, and we hope that you will calmly consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel. Until next time.